And welcome and thank you to everyone for being here today. It is an interesting trading webinar with Adam, Eris and Simon Campbell. I'm Sheila from Fineco Bank. And today we are going to talk about the um, power of uh, the Fineco X uh, for dynamic stock selection, how to use the platform in the best way and how to implement uh, strategies and techniques uh, through market vol volatility. Uh, just before going into the details uh, with our guests, let me shortly focus on the very competitive pricing that uh, Fineco Bank offers. Uh, first, with Fineco Bank, there is no cost to open a trading account and there is no monthly fee or activity fee. Uh, for stocks, the trading commission is a flat fee depending on the mar market are traded. Um, for the stocks uh, listed on the London Stock Exchange market, it's only £2.95 uh, flat fee. And on the US markets, uh, it's $3.95. And for the European markets, it's €3.95, also flat fee. Uh, this means that you will pay that commission per order executed, no matter the counter value of your order. Uh, also, we offer CFDs. And we are even more competitive because we offer zero commission trade on the UK, the US and European share and index CFDs with no additional spread applied. Uh, today, our guests are professional found trader Adam Harris. Hi, Adam. And the founder, of, uh, and the founder and CEO of Run the Clock uh, trader Simon Campbell. Hi, Simon. So let's now begin our session. All questions are more than welcome, of course. If you have questions for Adam and Simon related to today's class, uh, please uh, use the chat you can find below the window. I will send you as well via chat the link you can use to schedule a demo session if you wish. It's a free group session with one of our trainers that uh, can help you to understand how to trade with our platform. Then now I leave the floor to you, Adam and thank you thank you very much um simon did you want to yeah, add just, anything into well, that i just uh, i don't know how we're going to follow that lovely accent sheila but thank you for the introduction <laughs> beautiful start uh, welcome everybody it's nice um it's a, a great we've got one hour and i've worked with adam harris from our background yeah ix media we do events in london we do online trading summits and under running the clock trader um, I've been in education with trading and investing seminars for longer than I can remember. Uh, and uh, that's how I came to meet Adam Harris uh, back in 2016, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, at least. Yeah, 15 or 16, yeah. Yeah, so and gave us a fantastic talk in London at the Around the Clock Trader Live uh, sessions. Uh, and we've remained friends uh, ever since, and we've been on uh, lots of courses together. Um, we help uh, do, do webinars. And obviously, Adam is a, a, a full time trader. You manage, well, not only your own money, but I know you professionally manage some funds as well. But you can expand on that. But it's just a great pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, what you. we're going to be talking about, um, I don't know, Adam will, will fuck this up, but we're, we're, we're look, we normally look at technical analysis. Um, we're normally quite technical forces, but tonight, what we want to do is show you the power of the FinecoX platform. Um, this is the new version of the Fineco, what used to be, I think, called the PowerDesk. It's been uh, upgraded and relaunched, uh, and it has a lot of exciting tools for researching and analysing stocks. And uh, Adam's going to, to take you through this, uh, let you know some of the stocks that he's looking at, let you know what is uh, going to be exciting in the market. What's going on in the market these days? It's exciting times, a bit nervous, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so, as Sheila said, we do welcome questions, so please uh, fire them over in the chat box uh, and we'll try to address all your queries uh, this evening. So, Adam Harris, uh, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me have a, just keep an eye on the time so uh, that we don't run over. So, um, I um, mentor a few people and uh, and it's interesting because um, I don't sell the mentoring per se. I don't really do it. I tend to be approached by someone who wants to be mentored and I do that. So there is, a, there's, I'm going somewhere with this, which is um, that usually the process that I'll cover with most people, for example, they might come to me and say, 
I want to learn how to day trade because that's the thing that's really being sold on the internet. There's a whole lot of, you know, there's, there's rewards for it, for, for doing it, but it's also a very, very difficult skill. And actually the journey so the journey that I kind of push my mentees through is first of all, let's get, let's start by building an investment portfolio for use because that's the easiest, the safest. Um, which is, it might not seem that way, but it is the easiest and the safest to do. It has the greatest probability of success. And also when someone is, um, uh, when someone is doing that, they, that they start to feel, because the, the goal really is to sort of take control of your finances. That's really something that you want to do to feel as though you can influence your finance, your own finance, um, and your own financial future for the positive. So the degree is how much and what I don't feel is spoken about enough is that there are so many different stages or options for people um, from very safe, high probability to requires a lot of practice. And because of that is much more volatile and can result in more losses until the skills are developed. That's your kind of spectrum. Day trading sits on the end of the spectrum of more volatility. I should do which side of you this way. So I should do uh, no, that's the right way. I got it the right way. So no, it is the side. Sorry, I'm just looking left to right, right to left. Anyway, and so the, the easiest, most straightforward way to do, which I want to talk about today, is to uh, to get a sense of. Excuse my dogs; they're now barking at the foxes that are starting to come out. Anyway, is to build a portfolio, and I want to start with a concept today of how one can go about doing that. What are the what are the ways in which you can do it? Um, and take you through a few charts and also, and, and really the secret to it, believe it or not, and it seems counterintuitive is simpler is better and don't have to take it from me. You can take it from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Uh, if you go ahead and YouTube search it, they'll tell you that, you know, going to these fancy, um, <clears throat> economics programs that you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on in the U S and all these very complicated, very complicated process. They will tell you in the same video, if you can go find it yourself, that they could teach you everything you needed to know in a week, seven days, they could teach you everything. And they basically that there's so much that's overcomplicated and it's very hard for us to let go, to think that it could be that simple. And that's the irony is of course, because people just never keep it simple, it always gets complicated and messy. And so what we're going to talk about today is to, um, to discuss, uh, the process of that. Okay. So first of all, because we're now in a bull market, which is very, so there's a couple of things that happen. The media is very slow. There's always a lag between the media saying, okay, we're back in a bull market. And they never say that in the, in the beginning. They never said at the beginning of the bull market, they only do it generally when you, when you go to a new high. So when the stock markets create fresh highs, that's the point at which already half of the bull market has usually occurred. And that's the point at which the media says, holy cow, we're going to new highs, must be in a bull market. But we are, and we're going to talk about how we identify that today. Um, secondly, there's a lot, and I see this on YouTube and it's garbage. There's a lot of YouTube stuff that talks about how the world is on the verge of a massive collapse here and there. And these are the terrible things that are going to happen. Um, and so there's one rule of thumb that I want you to keep in mind is that the more, the further out we can see a potential danger, um, the less likely it is to happen. So what that means is if we don't see, if we're on the Titanic and we don't see that the, the iceberg until the very last minute, we're going to hit it. But for the most part, concerns about market bubbles and uh, inflation and possible housing bubbles and crisis in certain countries and debts that's a big problem and debt ceiling and all this kind of thing that happens most people are very aware of it so there's a whole lot of content on youtube that you can you'll come across very quickly that talks about doom and gloom and how this is the biggest crisis we're on the verge of this stuff and actually the thing is that people think that um, the the Fed and the central banks aren't paying attention to this stuff they are and actually the more we talk about it the less likely it is to happen and I'm going to give you an actual example of this in 2011, I was in the early first couple of years of my learning how to trade. And back then, gold had started. So let's go to the chart. We'll jump to the platform. We'll have a look at gold. We'll go on to that one. It doesn't really matter which one it is, but we'll go up here to, let's go to the weekly. And we'll just change it here and we'll have a look at gold. And this is a true story. This actually happened. What is that? That doesn't look like gold. So, uh, what is the FinecoX platform, isn't it? You just switched on. Yes, it is. I beg your pardon. So I'm on the new platform. It's a browser-based HTML platform. It's very nice, very fast and intuitive. Um, and it's still, the features are being added all the time. So in other words, the version you see now will have more features and more power in even the next three months. So it's very cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, I personally, I've, 
I've been waiting for this for a while because we knew Antonio said to us, he couldn't tell us anything about the platform. He just said, there's a new one coming and it was so very excited about that. Uh, okay, so let's go through and have a look at, uh, da, 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 da. we'll go through and have a look at this one. So, you, and it's very hard to break it, so to speak, just play with it. It's very uh, difficult to do any harm with it. So just go and enjoy that. Let's go through and have a look at commodities and we'll have a look at gold. This is just a futures contract. I want to just see how much of the history I get of this one. Not much history there. I'm looking for a full history on it. Um, and usually I would do that. So that would actually be through CFD. Let's just try CFDs. Let's try commodities here. That's the same one we just looked at. Okay, let's try futures and let's just go through CME. And let's have a look. Do we just have the indices? Uh, da, da, da. I might have had this. I'm just trying to think now. I might have had this one. Commodities. Why do we not have this stuff yet? There we go. Um, bear with me. It's not too. Uh, da, da, da. Again, we won't have futures contracts very really come with a lot of history. But let's go with this. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay. So in uh, 2011, which you can see the tail end of it over here. Whoopsie. It's very fast. It's very fast. So this is what happened. Gold had just been this steady, steady, steady grow. And it started to go up towards 1900 um, at the time. And what I want you to take away from this true story, this history repeating itself. And it's interesting because although they say that, you know, past performance doesn't, you know, um, doesn't necessarily mean future success. The, the fact is that history repeats itself way more than it doesn't. And we, and this is something that I lived through. So when this was starting to accelerate and getting out of control, what happened was back then, there was all this, the, you were getting on all the forums and in all the different areas where you might source, trying to learn how to, or look into this. There was this, in the same way that they had with cryptos, how cryptos were, you better get into cryptos, you have to do it. And there was this urgency to get into it. Gold, they were saying, there were all these, you know, 50 page long PDFs that spoke about how all these reasons why you needed to accumulate physical gold and silver. And it all sounded very reasonable. This is the danger. It all sounded incredibly reasonable, which is, and so it, and so a lot of people panicked and actually got into that. And subsequently gold just topped out mm. and ultimately had a correction, came down, broke down below these lows at 20, uh, around about 2013 and didn't break out again until 2019. And it's only just started to go up now again. And so the, the, the point of this story is that first of all, technically you would have understood it was overstressed if you didn't, if you couldn't hear anything, if you just had, if, you know, if you weren't looking at the media, if you weren't reading and it wasn't even in the newspapers, it was all online garbage. Um, and it's kind of, and they, and the same sort of thing is happening today. So it would, it causes a panic. People draft this, these kinds of content, either because they believe it themselves or because it helps them sell physical gold, they get a commission on it. And so they create this drama. And so we have to be very much aware of that. So um, it isn't happening at the moment, but it's happening in other areas. There's a lot of panic about debt and all kinds of other things that potentially people need to be doing certain things. So first of all, the more fear driven the article is, the more fear driven the content is, the less likely it is true. Um, that has been my experience. If I can pass that wisdom on to you, the more fear driven this stuff is, the less likely it is true, especially on a YouTube video. Okay, there's all kinds of rabbit hole stuff down there. So please, uh, please just don't get sucked into that stuff at all. Okay, especially if it's fear driven, then it's garbage. Okay, I... so if it sounds panicky, don't do it. You know, like if the title is like the, the big banks, what they're not telling you and what the government's keeping from you, it's all garbage. Okay, so I want to, because I'm very anti-conspiracy theory, because that's why how people lose money, because they get ideas in their heads, and then they're shorting the market when it's going long. Okay, so let's go back to the slide here, and let's talk about how, what we need to see on the charts to see them turning around, because we're going we're to go from this to a selection process, how we select items for our portfolio, and then we can look at a few real charts. So the key thing here is really how we have these structural highs and lows in the market. Lower highs, lower lows means that the sellers are in control. They're able, they're not able to create fresh highs. And that the market, even if you could never see a chart, if charts didn't exist, people were looking at prices, it just implies that, you know, above a certain area, there aren't enough buyers. It's actually what happens is price eventually will come up to a point where it will eventually break up and you start getting a confirmed change in trend from a downtrend of lower highs, lower lows, you get high lows, high highs. 
Incidentally, by the way, I've got the chat and the question box open. So if you have any, please feel free to ask questions as we go. So this is just showing you different ways in which it can happen. In this particular case, we come up, we sort of produce an equal high, but then we produce a high low. And actually, it's only when you break that, when you get that confirmed high high, that's when you have that confirmed change in trend. We're going to look at a few other carriers. I'm going to give you a few other proprietary kind of tips as to other things that will tell you that's kind of where we are. This one is a little bit different. This one produces a lower high and a high low and then goes straight into it. So it doesn't really, it doesn't produce a double kind of double top there changes. So, excuse me, once you get that kind of confirmed break, at that time, if we had gone from a bear market into a bull market, um, then the media would not recognize that at all. Okay, so there'd be a lot of doom and gloom. In fact, the market is at its most optimistic at the highs and it's at its most pessimistic at the lows. All right, um, so we need to be aware of that. By the way, I'm not referring to someone like um, uh, Michael Burry, who uh, you know shorted in 2007, 2009 global financial crisis. He called a lot of the reasons why the markets went short now. Um, he's not, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he was bearish, but he's now bullish, okay? So the point is, is that you must also understand that sometimes someone will call what they expect the market to do just in a given period of time. Not that that is necessarily going to be the way the market is going to be into the future. Um, and so, for example, he was talking about it and 18 months later, he wasn't, he stopped, he's changed his tune. So it's very important that we need to also learn to have trust, to have faith in our own um, analysis of the markets and to go, look, if the market does this, it couldn't do it if it was weak. It can't do it if it was weak. Um, okay, so this is kind of one area. This is another way in which we could see a bull market starts to go into a bear market. So imagine you are looking at a weekly chart here. You're looking at the highs and the lows and we start to break below these lows. So now the market is capable where in this particular case, it couldn't go any lower because the buyers were propping it up. Now we can see the market has started to explore below the previous lows. That's kind of key. Then it isn't able to create a fresh high, creates a lower high. And then when it breaks that low, it's a repetition. It's a second fresh low. And then there's a sentiment change. And remember that there's certain people that get in early and get in and out. They'll get in and out. They'll be the first people getting in and out of the markets because they have experience doing it. And then there'll be people that tend to follow and eventually you reach a tipping point where most people have started to get what's going on. And so you get those stages, All right? It's just a standard behavior in the markets. It actually happens every time there's a market turning point. It happens everywhere. It isn't just when there's a change in trend. Every single swing high and swing low you see has that shift from more people to fewer or fewer people, the initial people, then wait in terms of purchasing and buying and that turns around. So here you can see how we shift to that as well. These are just two different variations of the same idea. We break a previous low, we produce a lower high, we get a confirmed lower low and lower highs, and then we're effectively in that bear market, which is generally um, on the monthly. But I'm gonna give you some other, I'll give you some other tips on that. So then <clears throat> the next thing that we do is in our selection process, I want you to imagine this, because it's very difficult sometimes for people uh, and it was difficult for me in the past um, to, to, to just completely ignore the fundamentals. How is it possible that you can look at the technicals and just ignore the fundamentals and still pick relatively good stocks? So the way that I want you to imagine it is that if you're listening to a heartbeat of a great company, of a healthy company that's performing well, that company is going to be producing steady profits. It's going to be uh, performing very well. And I want to separate this from gambling, where someone is like, well, I think that uh, this company is getting into AI and it's going to do incredibly well. Nobody's ever heard about it. It's only two years old and the stock price is going down, but I think I'm going to put money on it. And then if it does go up a hundred times, then great. That's not really the same thing. What we're, If you really want to rest at night, sleep at night and make consistent earnings, you really want to put your money in. And this is the same thing Buffett would do, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, is put your money into a solid, reliable, safe company that has the performance and that would be the majority of where your risk would be, which is makes it very safe. And then you could put a portion of your budget into higher risk, higher reward potential setups. Right now, I would classify Tesla as one of those, for example. Tesla's track record is a bit choppy. The products are very popular um, and they have great potential. They are getting caught up. Everybody's now clued in about like electric cars and, you know, all kinds of things. So definitely that is a way there's now a lot more competition in that area. But at the same time, management is a bit temperamental and there's some, you know, kind of, you might disagree with Elon Musk's political views. And so all of a sudden you're like, well, I, I like the cars, but I'm not sure about the owner anymore. And then there could be a problem with that. So whereas 
what you're looking for is stability because stability is reliability. That's where it's likely to perform in the more likely in the future to perform the same way it has in the past. So when you're looking at that heartbeat of a really nice, strong, healthy company, it's usually a very steady, reliable uh, performer. That's what it's going to do. Okay. If something gaps a lot and it's spiky and it's got a long history. So let's go, let me show you an actual one, for example. So let's go in and let's switch this up and go through and have a look at but BP. Okay. So let's switch it up and go and have a look at it on a monthly basis. And let's follow it all the way through. What's how much history we've got here. Okay. So if we go back here, look at this incredible growth. And then it hits 2000. The year 2000. And since then, it's been mostly garbage. So people are a fan of it because it's a big brand. They know that big oil makes money. Maybe there's dividends. They're motivated to do it. The problem is, is that it's a fact that if you had been buying, it's never really beat its performance in those initial years. And since then is in a very gentle, slow downward trend. Okay. And it's very much tied to oil. So then you're kind of stuck with that, which is fine until they make some sort of switch. But my point is, is to separate the heartbeat, the performance of the company from the brand. Okay, so you want to find something that is, it's very similar to buying property, right? The two things that are most accessible to the average individual on the planet, to the average sort of uh, income earning person um, that will help them build wealth outside of a salary is property and uh, property and of course stocks. That's it. These are wealth building machines. Obviously there's other stuff you could do, invest in wines, you could, you know, buy yourself a vending machines. There's lots of other little kind of side gigs that can do it, but stocks and property historically, historically going back centuries have performed incredibly well. So the process here is that you might only have a budget for certain things, but your money is safer, not necessarily put with a brand you love. Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street, these are great books. He says, look, if you love using a product and everyone else you know loves using it, chances are it's a good buy. However, um, at the same time, we know lots of brands come and go. If you ever remember Betamax versus VHS, or you might look at something like General Motors in the US, um, you know, they're not necessarily performing as well. So the first idea would be to find something that has a historical success, which will, I'll show you. So this is Microsoft. Okay, so this is Microsoft, and if you look at it on a much larger basis, so let's bring it back into a weekly chart. You can see that historically, it's been a very good performer. It's had a very nice correction, and it, it's gone back to, uh, this is its performance, nice healthy retracement, beautiful buy signals there, and it's now picking back up again. So the performance on this, and especially even if you go back to a daily, uh, look, it's just steady. It's very, very steady, and the steadiness is what makes it a safer. The steadiness and the general, you know, the history of how long it's been steady is actually what makes it predominantly a safer bet. Um, so this is how we're picking something by its heartbeat. We're looking at something going, this is a strong, steady heartbeat versus something that's erratic, gappy, spotty. It's like, uh, not really sure what's going on here. Okay, so it doesn't mean that they can't necessarily have their day in the sun, but you have to decide also, you can mix and match. But if I was big brother giving you advice, your big brother, not big brother uh, government, um, I'd be saying, look, how much stress can you handle and how much money can you, how much risk are you taking? And, um, and you know, you know, yeah, people go and it can have a 30, 40, 50, 60% chance of a drawdown in their accounts, but usually for stocks, it'll tend to recover. So this is another thing. And I'm quoting Buffett, Peter Lynch, and there's a third chap I'm missing. I'm quoting them. And basically their philosophy was that you should never sell. All right. You should never sell if you, if you, you should just never sell unless you absolutely have to. The idea was you should always buy when there's a market correction. And if there was a market correction, you, you should definitely not uh, sell. You should always keep it because the market will always recover. Um, and that's just coming from them. And I tend to agree, but I tend to also want to be able to, uh, tend to want to be able to buy in those situations. So to go back to the slides here, I want to talk very much about the MACD. So again, too many indicators just overcomplicates the whole thing. We're looking at the price section, the charts, the moving averages. That's your heartbeat. That's the quality of it. We're reverse engineering it. You show me a company, company of a certain market cap, so it's a certain size and it's got enough history. You show me the chart and I can tell you that company has to be performing well because you can't produce a steady heartbeat on the chart otherwise. It's just not possible. Okay. Um, there are two things that move a stock's price. One is the company's actual performance, and the second one is the public's perception of the value of the brand. So if people fall in love with the brand, it suddenly takes off. If they're not interested in it, it might 
might go down. But if it's steady and people don't really care about it, it has to be a good company because it's just earning. Dividends is a separate discussion, not that much separate, but we'll keep, we'll keep, we'll go on with that. Because in an ideal world, if you buy a property, all right, you want that property to increase in value over time, ideally, and you also want rental uh, income from that. All right, so dividends you've got to think of as rental income. And what you don't want to do is buy a property because in that area you get really good rental yields and in 10 years time it's lost half its value, you can't sell it. And you realize that with inflation and your earnings of rental yields, which will drop over time as well, you've just lost money. So making a decision based on dividends alone is historically foolish. There's better ways of doing things. So ideally you want something that has a relatively decent heartbeat, so to speak, and also earns dividends. Failing that, you should opt for something, don't even worry about the dividends and just go for the performance, the returns. So the MACD. What I love about the MACD, you can use Williams percent R, you can use RSI, you can use CCI. There's lots of indicators you can use that will basically track the momentum. So is the stock bullish? Okay, you should be able to see it on the chart. But if it has started to slow down, your eyes, if, especially if you're new to this, your eyes might not be able to, you might not have observed that it started to lose momentum. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. So, um, so here we've got a really nice steady heartbeat. And if we look at the most recent highs, we can, we can see that the MACD is continuing to produce fresh highs. This is the best way to use the MACD or momentum indicators such as RSI is that it should continue to match the performance. So if you're getting fresh highs on price, you should get fresh highs, high lows, high highs on your MACD. If you're getting that, it is matching it. It tells you the trend, the pace at which the market is moving is steady. If the pace slows down, then the MACD will show it first. It'll start to generally go bearish. We've had this as separate uh, discussions and I think you can find much more detail on this on the Finico YouTube page that we've done that specifically goes into just using the MACD so you'll understand that. What I like about this. Can I just, uh, is, it, is the MACD one of the indicators on the Fineco X platform? Is it a default indicator or do you have to? Switch? Oh, you'd have to add it. So good, good point. So let's go through and do this. Let's right. go through and I want to add another chart here. So I'm just going to go through, I'm not worried about that. And I'm going to pick something. Um, let's pick uh, Apple. Okay. So let's just go with Apple. Anything you want, it's fine. Let's go with Apple. There's my chart. So this is my default chart, just comes up with price and so on. Uh, and I can, so I want to add something to it. Okay, so I'm going to go through to, we've got some draw tools as well. And I can go through to my indicators over here. So I want, to, I can have my favorites as well. I can create those. I want to add the MACD. So I'm just going to type in, uh, there it is. I'm going to add that to the chart. And you can see it's coming at the bottom. So mine is different because I've edited it. So you'll see here when I measure it, it asks me to right click to manage it. So I could just right click to edit those settings and I can go through. Now, personally, I prefer to, uh, I prefer to remove the histogram. Obviously that is a dealer's choice. Again, that's dealer's choice. It's up to you whether you want to keep it. It isn't necessary to me. So again, less is more, just keep it really simple. We're not having to make decisions on this stuff on a daily basis. You have to make these decisions every few weeks, if anything, because that's how bullish the market is. Remember, there's only like five trading days to a week. So for example, this low and this low, what's the difference there? That's the 24th and that's the fourth. That's 20 days apart. So there's an entry opportunity. There's an entry opportunity. There's an entry opportunity and so on. I would quickly add you, because it's not in the slides, quickly add that a lot of these turning points in an uptrend often have green candles. Just be aware of that. So part of the reason I wanted to add the moving averages is because the moving averages are a really nice organic trend line. It's an organic trend line that tends to meet price. Excuse me. And that is where my entry opportunities can occur. So when it starts to retrace, a lot of people panic because they're coming down. They don't know if this is the beginning of a change in trend. We are currently in a bull market. All right, um, let's talk about this very quickly. I'm aware of the time. We're okay, 28 minutes past. So one of the most profound books that I have ever read to do with economics would be Ray Dalio's uh, New World Order. He's got a whole lot of amazing stuff, but basically it's very simple uh, with regards to kind of how, for the most part, what under the under, this is why I say a lot of the stuff that's online can be, can be rabbit hole stuff that isn't really there. When a nation is productive, when people are employed and they're actively working, that is when a, a company's economy tends to be at its healthiest. Okay, which it seems like an obvious statement, but 
there's a couple of other things. If you have a wealthy middle class, um, you tend to have, uh, you also tend to have a stable economy and a stable political environment. In other words, you get your unrest when you have, a, when the middle class is eroded and you basically have a lower, poorer class and a very wealthy upper class. Because by that time, the wealthy tend to have a lot of the power and they tend to naturally want to protect what they have. It's a weird thing, even though they have more than enough. And then the poorer class get dissatisfied and then you have either a peaceful or a violent revolution and then it, it kind of resets. So when you have a wealthy uh, or a healthy middle class, you, it tends to act as a buffer, it tends to, um, and your upper, upper echelons are paying a fair amount in terms of taxes. Um, you tend to have a very, much more organic kind of flow between things and everything is a lot more stable. Um, and so what you currently have when you look at the US is uh, very, very low unemployment. Um, one of the issues they're trying to overcome now is to, to, uh, is to get the wealthy to pay more taxes, which is very important to stabilize the economy. It's crucial. Um, and this is fascinating. These are the incredible, these are the stats. So we live in the UK, for example, where a salary above 100,000 is, is like, there's less than 1% of the, the country that, that earns that. So it's not actually as much as you might think. And in the US, a, a household of two incomes makes uh, 200,000 in a year. Okay, so it's, it's that's a, you know, that's that's one, uh, sorry, that was, what was that, 200,000? That's something like 2% or something of the population, sorry, a bigger one, one and a half percent of the population earns that much, which, and so they want to tax people who make 400,000 and above, which is less than half a percent of the population. But what they would do in terms of um, reducing the debts and the overall structure is incredible because that, that little less than half a percent makes more money than the rest of the markets combined. And therefore, if they were able to pay back, they're using the same infrastructure, they're using the roads, they're using everything, they're just not paying, contributing back towards it. So it's really important to do that to kind of stabilize the economy. So the reason I bring this up is because a lot of people tonight, if you're listening tonight, you might be concerned about, are we really in a, is it a bull market or very safe? First of all, low unemployment is good. People working is very good. The debt, uh, for example, in the US, the debt, the deficit is being reduced. It's being reduced. That's a good thing. Um, and then also growth in terms of that. We can see Europe is also starting to stabilize and become a lot more strong. Uh, we see uh, there's a whole lot of things that are very, 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 very positive signs. We can see there's a bit of unrest in other parts. But overall, it's actually not that bad. The media doesn't make money from giving you good news. They make money from giving you bad news and make you stress, make you click on stuff and making you addicted to do that. I know it sounds very pessimistic, but that is actually how they kind of do it. And they compete these days with that sort of thing. So the whole point is that right now, the basis for the, for the stuff is looking very good and I don't want people to kind of stress about it too much it's looking very very good and it doesn't change instantly it takes anywhere from six months to 18 months to go from a bull market to a bear market and a bear market into a bull market so if we go over here and we have a look at we'll, we'll go back to Microsoft so we'll have a look at that and imagine here you're looking at uh, or one of the indices so let's see if we can grab one of the indices I've actually created a template here so when I go through to this I have a little template where I've saved everything and I can load one so this one is my one and it brings in the moving averages and it brings in the MACD with the colors. So easy enough for me to create that as a uh, template. Can you just talk us through what, what we're looking at? Go a little bit, a little bit slowly so we know what moving averages we're looking at, Adam. If that's okay, right. so we have got uh, straightforward, and let's not overcomplicate it, default settings for the MACD. Default settings are perfect. The I'm using a red 50. Uh, moving average. It can be simple or it can be exponential, it can be linear weighted. The differences between them is very, very small. It's not nothing, but it's small enough that it doesn't ultimately change the, the, the approach and the strategy we're talking about. We then have a blue 20 and a white 10. Okay, so the 10 and the 20 become this very nice location, this organic trend line where price will often ref return to that area, like a train station. Where price comes back to it and then heads out so it's a really great location to then look for potential entry opportunities into a trend just can i just um clarify would you begin with technicals and then look at fundamentals or i'm going to that's a great question i'm going to i'm going to um show you something as well um because i also want to talk about the scanner i want to talk about the scanner that is also here so there's lots of amazing tools that are available to you Right. So I will come back to that. Now I've got to yeah. just get back to my tab, which is over here. Um, and so there's a couple of things I want to talk about as well. Uh, when we look at the indices and uh, I can go through, uh, let's see if we've got them over here. So we've got commodities. I want these. Let's go through on these ones. So let's look at 
the uh, S&P 500. So why the S&P 500? The S&P 500 because it's a massive, uh, the US economy is obviously the biggest economy in the world. China is, is running sort of parallel and very similar. Um, so for example, one of the kind of things is, oh, you know, is the dollar gonna lose its reserve currency um, status? Very unlikely within our lifetime for the following reasons. Do you remember Brexit? Do you remember how what a what a mess that has been? And all that was was literally just one country kind of leaving uh, the EU, and that just caused that much chaos. So what that has done now is just basically caused everyone to go, let's absolutely not do anything crazy like that before. So none of those states will be willing to leave uh, the US right now. The second reason is language differences. If, for example, China is going to be a bigger economy in the future, there's going to be a language difference and there's going to have to be a transition. So you've got all these English speaking countries on the existing status who are just not looking for any extra stress right now. So they're very unlikely to do it. The US economy is doing really, really well. There's just no reason to do it. So it's not going to happen, I don't think, in our lifetime. Or if it is, we'll see it coming a long way away. It doesn't happen overnight. Okay, so we can just relax about that as well. Next up, this is the S&P. It's great. It's 500 large cap companies. They're all over the world. You know them. Starbucks, Nike, uh, Microsoft. You just name it. They're all there. And so let's talk about what it looks like on the weekly time frame. It's really where you get a sense of bull market versus bear market. And... When your indices, so in other words, when you're building your portfolio, you want to get a sense of, you want to first of all look at the major index. The major index is your your weather vane for whether we're in a bull market or a bear market. You want to look at the biggest one in the world, which is going to be the US. You can look at the NASDAQ, the S&P, uh, and the Dow Jones. Collectively, they're an amazing glo sort of global indicator of that. Then you can look at the FTSE. So for example, if you're in Europe, you want to have a look at um, the DAX, you want to have a look at that, that's fine. You just want to get a sense of all of them, are they on the right side of stuff? So the simple guide is, I'm going to oversimplify it, is generally speaking, generally speaking, if price is above the 50 period moving average, if price is above the 50 period moving average, generally we're in a bull market, okay? So for 95% of the time, it means we're in a bull market. So we're back now, according to that, we're in a bull market. But it isn't just that. Technically, we could see higher lows and higher highs on the weekly chart. Okay, so that's the second thing. We're, get, we're in an uptrend on the weekly. That is also something that tends to only happen in a bull market. So we've got two things now. We've got a weekly uptrend and we're above the 50 period moving average. This is about six different indicators. They're all there. Okay, so they all look good. It's not just that. I want to see the NASDAQ in that. I want to see the Dow Jones in that. I want to see some of the others. So if we go back and I have a look at the German DAX, let's go and have a look at that one, and we can compare that. We're, we're at all-time highs, We've, we're above the 50 period moving average, we're producing, um, we're producing high lows, high highs. It's not just that, it's a smooth market, it's not erratic, it's already there. That doesn't mean I'm not going to have retracements for a couple of weeks, doesn't mean we're not going to have those, we're going to have these, but we are still in a bull market, and that typically means we should be looking to buy. Um, now, 2023 is a funny year. The reason it's a funny year is we have, you've got a U.S. Uh, administration that is trying to, when I was a kid, there was always this thing of, you know, you don't want to get, you don't want to have too much debt on your credit card. You want to save 25% of your, whatever money you make, because of course, back then you could afford to buy a house and a car on your savings. You could afford to do it. Today, it's a bit crazy. And the U.S. is trying to sort of go back to that old fashioned thinking of maybe you shouldn't be borrowing too much money. Maybe you shouldn't, um, your interest rates were higher when I grew up. The interest rates were in South Africa were 14% on property and, and never went below 7%. Whereas now we might be looking at 2 or 3%. So there is an attempt now, and I hope it stays the course, is to try to get people used to higher interest rates. If it means we have to spend a little bit less, um, but as a result, we also get into less debt and maybe the world slows down a bit, then in the longer run, that's actually better for everyone. So that's kind of what's, what's trying to happen at the moment. And it's starting to show up, and this is where a lot of the, the, the confusion is coming from, that, that certain things like bond yields and different things aren't making sense anymore because the systems are starting, the cogs are busy adjusting, and basically, but it's not bad stuff. It just means that this is where we're trying to get to. We're trying to make sure we don't spend as much because we've obviously become very, that's the kind of world we live in, where everyone's trying to encourage you to spend. We're trying to slow that down. And obviously it's a good tip. So here we could see, uh, and so why I bring that up is because 2023, we could still potentially see a bit of another correction, but I have to say that right now, there's, uh, everything looks fine. Everything looks nice and healthy. Yes, one of the things that happened during COVID was people saved a lot of their money and then they started spending it. So there's a lot of companies now that have absolutely inflated their pr prices 
to get that those savings out of people. They're not consciously doing it. They're just going, look, people have money and they're spending it. So let's let's keep our prices high. And they'll only drop their prices when people stop spending and run out of their savings that they've built up. And then we'll see a bit of a correction or you'll see corporate profits will take a little bit of a hit um, and we'll possibly see a bit of a correction then. But that might not be this year. It might be next year. It might still be this year. And then once we get through that, then what will happen is inflation should cool right down and then we kind of get there. But if you're wondering why there is still inflation in some areas, it's corporate profits really keeping it high. They don't have to be going that high. That's why you're hearing all these corporations you know, record profits and everything's performing quite well. Okay, so we've, uh, this is looking nice and bullish. That's the basic criteria. I want you guys to get used to looking at it. If it's generally above the 50, it looks good, which means we can then go and have a look at potential stocks that match this. If we go through to the platform, there's just an amazing little feature that you could use as a starting point. One big tip that I would give you is to say, for example, is to, is to, keep, a, to keep a watch list of your favorites. Um, because to go through the scanner from scratch every few months to see if there's anything new that's cropped up is actually very time consuming and, and it uses a lot of energy. So you want to be able to keep a watch list of your absolute favorites. So maybe that means you've got to spend a month going through all of them to find the ones you like, but keep that list. And then that list becomes the one that you look to get in and buy shares if you can. So what I did here. Because of the settings, I can. There, this can also be a technical filter. And answer to your question, Simon, what I've done, yeah. for example, is I've said I want to. I want this above the 50 period moving average or the 20 period moving average. I've also got a crossover moving average happening as well. And then I kind of. And then I've added very importantly near the bottom, I can add in a market cap. So over here, for example, I want the market cap above a certain amount. So really, I want to focus on the top 500 companies. They are less likely. They've got more cash reserves. They're less likely to go into uh, have any kind of trouble with that. Okay. So, um, and then you can go through them and you can have a look at the ones you want. What I would say is that when you kind of, when I'm holding my mouse pointer over this and I get, I have to refresh this. I'm going to have to refresh it. That's why it's not showing. Sorry about that. Let's just go through this stuff. Adam, the, the, I mean, these filters are really powerful because uh, you can, you can, you can search for a whole bunch of stocks that are maybe been trading below their, Average their, their valuation price uh, and, and oh, yeah. starting to uptrend again, or you can find stocks which are just trending, been trending higher for the last three or four weeks. Um, there's no end to, to how many. And I think if you just scroll up a little bit, you've already got some preset filters in there you, for uh, looking for undervalued stocks and the, the little symbols. Yeah. Yeah, I do. So, um, so, th so what I c you could do is if you like, I have no idea where to start. You could start with this. You could start by putting a market cap on it and using a couple of these things and just play with it. I recommend that you just kind of play with it and then you can heart it here. So then you get a bookmark on that. You can create your watch list that way. But if I open this up, I was going to say, I don't always trust this chart. I want to see the chart myself because this chart might be a daily chart. It might only be a, it might be a four hour chart. I want to see the actual chart here. So this isn't bad, but it's a daily chart. So it's only, it's, it's, it's like, it's a minute chart. I want to, I want to see a much longer performance. And this is where I would then go through and have a look at this on the platform. So go across the platform. I've done it again. Sorry. Um, are you, sorry, I'm going to quickly do a temperature check. Is everyone, are you enjoying this? Is this working for you? Are you finding this useful? Um, so then I would potentially go through and uh, find this. So we'll go through and I'm just curious, Abercrombie. The, the, chart, the chart on the platform is, is a sort of a, it's a fairly basic one, but it's enough to see, to let you see yeah. trending up or down, but for real, yeah. going a bit deeper with the technicals, you want to go switch over to the Fineco X platform. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Uh, and so we look at this and this gives me a whole, so what, what's the heartbeat of this? And so the, then the question that I want you to think of is, to, you, can, you can say, listen, I like the brand. I want to buy. I want to buy a stock in this. I want to be a shareholder of it. So one approach is to have sort of A class in your, in, we create our own A class stocks and our B class and C class. A class would be perfect things like Microsoft or uh, Costco or Apple. Those are like amazing ones. They don't, they're not always that expensive. So before you kind of test, it was expensive. At one point, it was like a thousand bucks a share, whereas... Apple might be 400 bucks a share, so um, or, or Berkshire Hathaway. So then the question becomes, so that would be A class. That's that's the best stuff if you can get it because it has the most perfect trends, and that would be primary. If I if I have a smaller budget or I have to or I don't want to have too many, I might have 10 stocks in it. Then I would go with A class ones, and A class would be the best looking ones that fit this criteria. 
this would qualify as either a B class or a C class, meaning the trend itself, the heartbeat, the quality of the charts is terrible, actually. Um, I can see that it is trending up now. Let's go and switch it to a weekly. I can see it's now in an uptrend. The problem is, is that how long do I really expect it to go up uh, into that? There's its all-time highs. That could be the case. And if you find yourself wanting to pick this over um, another stock that has a better performance and it's the same price, then that might be because you're kind of you want to get a thrill out of it you know being a you know it's an underdog and you want to get a thrill of that and be very careful of how you're why you would pick something over that clearly isn't necessarily um the fact that it has you know has never you know outperformed or, or isn't stable implies that how long do you want to wait before you get a return on your investment do you want to wait 10 years or do you want to wait two years because if you're using my process you should get a return on your investment similar to warren buffett within you know immediately if not within the same year Okay, so the next part, because I want to go through these and I want to make sure I get all of these things here. So here, for example, we can use that MACD, first of all, to warn us, so if we, to, to where the market was running out of steam. And I, I don't know if I got rid of that. Did I keep it? Here it is. Okay, so we had, you know, we had this point where the market was topping out. So again, I, I you know, I have a YouTube channel where I'm doing weekly analysis and this is, you can kind of see because I progressed to all of these. So you can go back and you can see where I was talking about those concerns. The main thing is the MACD does two things. It'll tell you the trend is nice and strong and healthy uh, and bullish. And it can also tell you, you know what, the trend is running out of steam. You should be extra cautious here. So I want to, I need to see these kinds of warning things, not just in the stock, but in the index, because the index is the collective performance. It'll tell you how everyone is doing, not just the one company. And it's incredibly powerful when, for example, you price is clearly encountering. So even if you didn't know anything beyond that point, you've got three uh, rejections of this level. Price has come down and you can see that it's consistently, this has been trending lower for a while. The language is important. It's bearish. It's been trending lower for a while. That implies the probabilities of this now going lower is very, very high. Okay. And it's, again, it's a daily chart, but it ultimately then ends up going down into that. Where it starts to turn around, here's an attempt. Here you get a lower low, here you get a higher low. So that implies, okay, it's bullish. It's going to try to turn around. Let's see if it does uh, uh, does for a bit, then it comes back down. So there's a shorter term correction, which actually, if I could just annotate on this, is actually, this is a weekly trend. That's a weekly trend and it carries on down. So um, as you start to get the high time frame stuff, you start to become aware of that. But here's where it really starts to turn around. Again, we've been bullish for a while, starts to trend higher. It's definitely lower there. Um, and also the, the, the overall bearish trend of running down here is actually starting to slow down. It's weird. It's starting to go from a steeper angle to a more flat angle. And so, especially when we break these highs, we get above the 50 period moving average, we start to create fresh highs. And I wanna remove this and I'm gonna do it again. Okay, so, First of all, we want to break above these highs. There's a level of support and resistance. Don't overcomplicate it. Once we start to break above that, we become more bullish. The bullish divergence combined, that's a break above that. So if we can break and do this and carry on and get above the 50 period moving average, all of those things, those are, you know, there's a lots of little things that will tell you we're kind of there. So, and then we start to trend higher and there we go. So um, I would say once we broke above this, you might not have been sure, but then we came back up and broke above this one. And then that's it. We're definitely now we've shifted, if that makes sense to you. So here we broke this high, which doesn't necessarily mean we we permanently have shifted gears. We went all the way back down again, but then we came back up, we broke this one again. So that now means the market is absolutely forming up and then it stabilizes. So here it's choppy because it's shaking out all the bears and more buyers are coming in and then it starts to stabilize as it now becomes mostly buyers. That's where we are now. So here, for example, you can see we've got a slightly lower high. We are overextended. What this likely means is potentially we've got a weekly retracement that's coming in, a weekly correction. So it's not a big one. We would come back down to 325, back into the moving averages. It's not a big one. It's tiny. So I'm not too worried about that. But that's a great buying opportunity. So for me, buying in the portfolio, simply put, I'm going to oversimplify it, buying in the weekly charts and the moving averages becomes a really good idea on the weekly charts. Um, and so I want to do that. I was also going to say that if you search online, you can find free spreadsheets that you can link up. So like you could get a Google sheet where you type in the, the you type in the um, symbol, ticker symbol, and it gives you, it'll update the spreadsheet live. Okay. So you can build that up and, ch and judge and you get free ones as well. Lots of free ones that you can also use if you wanted to, that will do your investment tracking where you 
you just put them in there and you can track that performance. So to go back to this, uh, this is a great one. It alerts us to a potential danger in those. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful quality of that. I wanted you to read the slide, please. I'll read it with you. And this is just chaos. This is General Motors. So as an exercise, because I'm going to give you exercise to build your confidence in this, and it's a very quick, easy thing for you to do. So first of all, let's talk about this. A steady, consistent heartbeat often reflects a healthy, strong company. Chaotic, irregular heartbeat. A really great company just shouldn't have that. Um, and, a, and a really crappy company shouldn't have a great heartbeat. That, like it doesn't, it can't, you can't fake it. And you can't do the two, you can't fake it. I say that, that's Enron. But even them, I would have to have a look at something like Enron or any of these, uh, these things like um, that, that have done that. So this is really good. I was going to say to you, don't get seduced by volume or dividends. Um, what I mean by that is they're helpful. Don't dismiss them, but don't make your decisions based on those. They are, to me, they would be added ticks in the boxes. Okay. Um, and really, I would just go, you know, I want volume to be above 500,000 on a daily basis. What that means, what that should mean is that you get lower gapping as well. Uh, in these kinds of cases, and this is where Finico is a benefit, is that you can physically, you know, own the shares. And so the cost, your transaction costs are competitive, but also you can jump between trading, day trading and trading, um, CFDs if you want, but you can also obviously physically own stuff as well, right? So that's a that's a big plus. Um, so the one that, are, this is the kind of strategy just to recap and then we'll go have a look at the charts. So we've got 10 minutes, we're doing okay. So first of all, when I'm looking at something, I'm looking at, I just want that market cap to be of a certain size and certainly I want the volume to be above 500,000 in general. Um, that should provide some stability in terms of that. Now you know, buying and holding the shares versus, in terms of gaps, that's all I mean. I just want to get something that isn't going to do that too much. And looking at its heartbeat, so to speak, if it has lots of gaps in it, then it's likely to continue to have lots of gaps in it. So I tend to prefer things, certainly on the weekly, that show almost no gapping in it. Um, weekly price should be above the 10 and 20 moving averages, okay, above that. So let's use this one as an example. Uh, we can see that here it's changed direction has gone, it's broken above these previous highs. This is fresh. Hot off the press. This is two days ago. The MACD is trending higher. Higher lows, higher highs. Okay, we've got higher lows and higher highs in price. We've broken through a level of resistance. We have broken above the 50 period moving average. We've got the 10 and 20 in the correct order. And we have price above the 10 and 20. Those things don't happen by accident. All those things imply that the sentiment has turned bullish. If you want to go and dig deeper and go into... Um, uh, what was the other one? Seeking alpha, all kinds of different things. That's absolutely fine. But technically, the boxes are ticked. Daily above the 50 EMA and the 200 EMA is a bonus. Okay. It doesn't have to be above both of them. But if it is, it's a bonus. Strong, clean, stable trend with minimal or no gaps. Super, super stable. Price. Uh, and then I'm looking for price to be in and around the 10 and 20 moving averages in that area. Looking for potential entry into joining that okay so main thing here is this just like this is ridiculously uh good so let's go to the chart and discuss this in a little bit more detail let's go through and have a look at um, using tesla as well you guys are very quiet are there any questions or anything that you want to ask as we go through this adam there's a, there's a question here actually um and it's it, it's the topic du jour artificial intelligence yeah. Um, what do you think about the new trend regarding artificial intelligence? Um, do you have a best stop to watch? I mean, that, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is. A, it's very tricky. Um, if I may, I want to also just talk about, I'm going to use a similar example, let's say cannabis. So a few years ago, cannabis is starting to become legalized for medical stuff. There's a lot of companies that are progressing with it, doing research and everything on it. Um, but actually, when you look, if you, well, I have done it, I've kind of researched into a whole lot of them. A lot of them had an initial boom and then they've kind of just gone down. They haven't really gone anywhere. And it seems as though the, the common, the thing that they have in common is there aren't um, almost as though there aren't developments. There aren't any real kind of developments happening on a regular basis. And therefore, there's no expectation of, well, this is going to produce new products or go anywhere. It's almost as though that market is now established. And that's why they just they've sort of stabilized. Um, and so whereas with AI, we kind of are aware that um, it's reached, uh, what's the mass consciousness? So, you know, I've been on ChatGPT from about a month after they started it. Um, and then within weeks, I mean, that's how quick it was. Within a month of that, everyone was talking about it because everyone was just saying, you've got to see this stuff. 
and it's hit Matt consciousness very quickly. And then I don't know if any of you have seen this, but the highlights from NVIDIA, so all your laptops all come with NVIDIA graphics cards, GeForce and whatnot. If you're a gamer, almost all of them now come with that. So NVIDIA are a tech company that have been in on this for the last couple of years. They, they use it for so many different reasons. There's a highlights video. It's about 20 minutes long on YouTube. It's worth your while to watch it doesn't necessarily all apply to to how we could benefit from it but it shows you it just blows your mind as to how they're using ai to help optimize factories that they can use so that they're optimizing the floor space to be building it they're using it to help them optimize the circuit boards because we we, we're now down in quantum mechanics because we can't go any smaller and we want to get things faster so they it can help us leapfrog where we're going so my thinking is generally to focus Uh, apart from the benefits of ai the stock nvidia is trading at 40 times its earnings now. So the, the danger that is that really we're getting into bubble territory, is it not? I mean, this is the... Absolutely, absolutely. So um, so let's go Let's go and have a look at that. So I... I videos are my thing anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I got into NVIDIA because of the technical indicators that uh, I showed you. That's all. It was like, this is where we broke above that high and that was it, and above that. But look, can I point out the quality of this trend? Just look at how stable it is. There's just no real craziness in its behavior. So would you say, Simon, that it's overextended in a way the train is very far away from the station? Yes. Where's the station? <laughs> the train's very far away from the station, yes. But if you pull the chart out, it could go more. Everybody said this with, with Apple. Everybody said this with Microsoft. Oh, yep. look, it's right up the top of the page, but it, it could go more and more. I, I, again, the technology, just as you're, as you're mentioning, is, is, is really sure. changing the whole landscape for... You know, Tesla did this, Tesla did this, and it came down. So I'm going to use that as a good example. Tesla was January 2020, December 2019, nobody, nobody cared about Tesla. Nobody cared about it. It was here, there, there. Nobody cared about it. And then two, three years later, everyone's like, everyone's knowing about it. And, and they've, in their brains, have imagined it's been around forever. And it was only two or three years that it had been around and its stock price went up. It was absolutely insane here. So, and now look, it kind of, it had a massive correction. Almost, it was a 618. If you guys do FIBS, it was most of a 618. It was actually, no, a bigger part. It was a 70 plus correction from the highs. And you can see it's starting to recover from that. So I'm highlighting this because this could be NVIDIA's journey. So if you compare this high and then this high, yeah, we could see this continue, but will it come down at some point? 100%. One of the, one of the big questions. 100% guys. it'll come down. Um, the question isn't, will it come down? The, 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 question is, uh, the question is how far? That's it. So when we have a look at this, keeping an eye on the time, we're good, we're good. Um, when... Surely it's China and to- Taiwan, I'm going to weigh heavily on. Oh, man. Yes. So, again, to bring in some geopolitics. And so people think, well, what does politics have to do with trading? Everything. Um, your, your economy is impacted by policies. What's the interest rate? What's the central bank deciding to do? Um, are, they, are they injecting QE? And those are all policies. And all of that comes from politics. Um, and so right now, for most, some people might not be aware of this, but the semiconductor the industry, the the future of kind of technology, a lot of it is coming out of Taiwan and the US has trade relationships with Taiwan and China wants to take Taiwan back and this we're competing on that. So believe it or not, uh, again, this is an area where there's going to be global conflict. And the concern is that the possibility exists. Taiwan doesn't want to be part of China. But this, this is a real, real conflict that is going to escalate, I don't know, in the next year, in the next five years. But it's a real danger. And so we're going to see the U.S. and China bump heads on that. And at some point, the, the U.S. might just allow, you know, they've got to weigh up what's less painful for them is whether they just let China basically absorb Taiwan. Taiwan doesn't want to, to be absorbed in. So that's a, that's a real, real threat that we have that's going to disrupt the technology markets. So you've nailed it in terms of mentioning that. So levels, key levels and the moving averages. And you can see here, this is it, the biggest tip. Price often comes back to that 50 period moving average, 50 period moving average. And so we could see price coming back. That 50 period moving average is a very real correction if this has a steep correction. Is it going to have a correction? Absolutely. If it didn't, it would be the first stock in history that never did. So it's that didn't. The real question is going to be where, you know, 
where, where is it going to come back to? The 50 period moving average is a great place. So it could have a correction back down to here or back down to here, and then it could have another big move. Uh, we could see something happen. And certainly you can see the MACD is just ridiculously, I'm not going to say over, overbought, but we're, we're at that area. So the clues are also in here. You can see it's starting to stall a bit. We've had a big volume move, a lot of stalls here. For me, it's another buy opportunity when it comes back to those moving averages, 100%, absolutely going to do that. Um, in, or, in order to answer your question about the selection process, about AI, um, I'm much happier to be with the companies that have large cash reserves and have already been working on AI for several years because they generally can throw money at it if they need to catch up. So if they're falling behind, they can just throw money at it to catch up. They can buy the best brains, they can do all of that stuff. And most of them already have been, they are the pioneers. So for me, somebody like, uh, apparently, you know, Microsoft's relationship with ChatGPT, um, but yeah, NVIDIA as well for me is, is kind of a no-brainer. I'm, I like Ryzen, so sorry guys. I mean, I'm, I'm always about, my old industry was the movie industry, so I'm all about power in, in laptops and computers. And the power we get in these cheap little laptops these days is more than my $50,000 kind of dollar machines used to cost back in the day. It was ridiculous. Um, and so I, I would be keen on that. So my, my logic would be pick a company again that its trend looks really good. I'm looking if it's if it's if the train if the price is very far away from the moving averages you have two choices you have a couple of choices but if you decide to buy now because you're afraid you're going to miss out you also have to accept that when it has its correction that you can't feel sorry for yourself uh, so I'm not this is not a criticism I'm saying you can consciously say listen I'd rather get in now and then in five years time you know that's kind of where I am and that's perfectly acceptable but you also need to be prepared and say to yourself okay if it corrects and it comes down to the 50 period moving average and then maybe turns around then then I'm fine but I could wait <clears throat> six to eight months for it you know to uh for it to kind of come back so that's just something that I want you to keep in mind as a thought uh let's go and show you another one so another one that did, that's looking great uh is Amazon so Amazon I've kind of jumped in on Surely we have another question for you, last yes. question, Adam. Yep. But then, in your opinion, it's better to analyze a stock only with technical analysis or also with fund fundamental analysis? So uh, that's a, obviously a fantastic question. And it will depend on your individual, um, when I say your, I mean everyone who's listening tonight, your individual level of comfort. I will predominantly pick stuff with a very large market cap and with a really nice performance and ideally five to ten years worth of data and what that actually does it's a filter of its own kind it tends to pick something with strong fundamentals because it's got a large market cap because it's got a strong it's got a history and a strong heartbeat generally speaking it has already demonstrated ticked the fundamental boxes because all that's going to happen is it's like i'm looking it's like the fundamentals are inside a box and i'm looking at the outcome of the box um you can go inside the box and have a look that everything's okay, but all you're going to find is it's going to produce that. So most people want to look at the insights to make sure that it produces the outcome. I'm looking at something that produces the outcome because that implies that the fundamentals are really good. But then I also, just to be sure, large market cap, you know, those kinds of things, I'll have a look at that. Um, and, uh, and so I'll tend to, so kind of the ones on my um, list, um, I have 55, sh I have um, shares, 50, 55 different companies at the moment. And funny enough, in the one portfolio, I don't have Tesla, um, but I'm bringing Tesla up now because it's looking really good. I wanted to show you um, this as well. So it's up to you. The filters that you can use on uh, on Finico's in in the in the client section are are fundamental tools. They are using technicals to filter, but they're also using things that you can use. You can look PE ratios. You've got all those there, so you can get the fundamentals there. I'm saying that I think that a perfect integration. Um, is to make sure that if you look at something that ticks all the boxes in, with respect to P ratios and all the, the, the different kind of things that you get that you would consider fundamentals, and then you look at the chart and the chart looks, you look at five years performance and it's just garbage, then that's a pass for me. Then it has to pass the technicals as well. Um, and there are times when I don't worry about it. If I know the brand and I know it's looking good. So I like Amazon. So here's an example. I'm not suggesting to you guys. This is not a suggestion. I'm explaining my rationale. I can see the history over time. I can see that it battles at this major level here as well. And you can see, again, you can see the MACD starting to deviate away from that. And then you had a level you break through. And this is called a momentum candle. That's when it burst through that line. But where are we now? From a monthly perspective, let's go back to the weekly and what is the status here. Look at the quality of this trend. We're now almost got the 10 and 20 and the 50 in the correct order. Price is above the 50. It needs to come back down, find support on the 50 period moving average and then take off. 
and the MACD is trending nice and bullish. So I'm expecting this to come back down and then I think I'll likely add into that scale, into that position. Um, and again, these, yeah, again, if I buy into this now, that's fine, but then I have to give myself three or four months while it runs down and needs a correction and goes back up. You just need to consciously take note of those things so that it isn't a shock to you when it happens. You can't say, oh, it's, it, it's not an indication that it's going to. And the beauty of this is when you tend to buy these, you tend to only temporarily lose value and it tends to come back up. So uh, there was, that's Amazon's a great one. I like the look of, of Tesla. And although I have some, this is personal stuff, although I personally am not a fan of Elon Musk anymore, uh, I still love Tesla products. And I understand my brother is a massive fan of Elon Musk. So while we were on holiday, we had this, we were bumping heads and it's just, a, it's just it how, it, it's how it goes. But this also looks good. So we've got a, a bit of a weekly candle here and I think we've got a good breakout, a nice little pullback onto the 50 period moving average, find some support, nice little bullish candle, one of these ones, which could happen at our next Finico webinar, we can talk about this, have a next one and talk about how this, um, because I think we could be at the beginning of the next bull market. And so I really think we should try to talk more about what the opportunities are. Um, and I'm happy to go on the record for kind of where I, where I feel about these things. I really think that this is one of the most amazing, like if I could go back to when I was 20 and just say every month, just put every, stop having coffee, put your coffee money into shares or stocks. I'd be, you know, I'd have been a, I'd be a billionaire by now. No jokes. So yeah. Well, I'm glad you're happy with you on record because you are on record. This this is being recorded, so so we'll come back in a month and 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 check out that. But exactly. If you want to go back and watch this uh, webinar again, then it will be published on the Fineco website, the video library, in the the education section of the website. Yeah. Uh, normally, it's up there within within. And the and again, if you like last time, if you send me a copy of it, I'll upload it to my YouTube channel as well. So we'll double the views on that as well. I'm happy to do that. And actually you did it last time. It went through on Telegram. It was great. Fantastic. Great. Well, we, we're, we're over our time, Adam. So, so listen, thank you so much uh, for, for, for joining us tonight. Any, any other questions, uh, those of you that are here, um, please fire them through. Otherwise, I think maybe just to recap, you, you do use the fundamentals, but you, you trust in the fundamentals that the technicals explain they draw you a picture of what the fundamentals are already saying is that is that is that a fair comment yeah you, yeah you, you, most people's goal is to just get started by building a portfolio and if you start with something that has that that ticks a few boxes that are technic that are arguably fundamentals you know market cap or p ratio or established um they will if you dig deeper will tend to show they already have the fundamentals so looking at the technicals is a is a cheat it's cheating because you're you're reverse engineering it. you're finding a company that looks really good that ticks a few boxes and then you can kind of go with that i t but what i spoke about today was that for people who are listening you can choose if you want to look into that further and the tools to do that actually exist within the finico website and then you can just add the technical stuff that i've spoken about today to, to show you kind of how the two work hand in hand. If you had to somehow find something that you really like the look of, but the technicals were very choppy, that to me would be a no-go. Fantastic. Um, and there's, there's the detail that you can, uh, you've got an ebook on MACD trading that, which yeah. is a lot more detail than a top trader. Um, you've got your YouTube channel, all sorts of sources. Well, so thank you, Adam. Thank you, Fineco Bank, for hosting us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Simon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, absolute pleasure as always. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to doing this again in the next, in the near future and seeing where the market is then. So thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Have a great evening to all. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,